in the days when these quilts were made, like, they were always natural products. It wasn't synthetic cloths or anything back then, so everything was cotton or silk or wool. So everything came from the land. And then we did see that a photocopy of the quilt, and it was just a black and white photocopy, but we did notice that it looked like fields, it looked like a landscape. And you can find so many things that kind of symbolize or quite similar to this landscape of the quilt out in everyday life, like like just even like the brick walls, they look quite like tailor quilts and just stones on the ground and everything. If you really think about it, if you really want to go out there and think about it, you can connect whatever you need to connect to something that you've made. Because back then, people used their inspiration from what they saw out in the real world. They didn't have TV, they didn't have radios. They used to use their inspiration from what they saw in the real world, and a lot of that is nature. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting, like, looking at the quilt and you'd see something, but the more you look, the more you'd see, and then you just keep finding different things and like more interesting things and like move on. It's kind of like you had to start off close up and see things close up before looking at the bigger picture because there's so much detail so close up, but then when you look at all the little details so close up, you look far away and it just makes something amazing. quote in the middle, when land is gone and money is spent, learning is most excellent. Like, I think we found that a lot of people had a lot of different views on it. Most people's views were that when you've spent all your money and you've lost all your land, education is the one thing that will get you it back. So when you have education, you do, it doesn't matter whether you have money or land. But Mary had a different view as well, didn't she? Yeah, Mary thought that it meant that if you've been through a bad experience, like if you've lost all your money or if you've lost all your land, then the value in it is actually learning from the experience. The poor people would have to take the sheep's wool off bramble bushes and thorns and stuff just to make their quilt because they couldn't afford to go and buy sheep's wool. They had to kind of scavenge it. Quilts actually were literally lifesavers. You know, if it was a really harsh winter, if you didn't have a quilt, there was a chance that you weren't going to make it through the winter. Like, it's more than just kind of a, a decorative thing. It's actually something that people really needed. Each person, like Gwenel, had her own scissors. It's kind of like a little like collectible thing as well, where you can have your own little tools that you use specifically. And I thought her scissors were amazing. Like they were so golden and just like personalized. And you know, you can really see that this is kind of more than a hobby for the volunteers. They used the nylon thread, which they found in their own archives, which was which women used to sew their own nylon stockings. So it was so fine as well. So you had such a difference between this really thick, solid thread and this really fine thread for two different things. Like they sewed the silk with this tiny thread, and they sewed the others with this thick thread as well. Looking at the things they were using, they had like a the surgical needle, which is like a weird hook needle, which I don't know, but then I suppose in in a weird way that they they are performing surgery on a quilt and the table is their operating table and the needles are their tools. Conservation and restoration process seems like it's been going on 
for a lot longer before it started at the Keridigian Museum because remember Sarah Paul was telling us about how there's certain patches of the quilt where it looks like people have taken a different approach to what she would have done where they've actually taken parts of it away and then sewn in new parts and you can see the difference of there's one patch on it which is massively diff different to the rest of the quilt so it's quite interesting to see how even people who might not have been connected to the quilt itself in terms of its origins would have been part of this line of people conserving it and restoring it and adding to it. And it brings into question as well really whether the best course for the quilt is conservation or restoration because it seemed to me that well obviously some of the silk was just completely disintegrated. Now in my eyes it would make more sense to replace that silk with with a new thing of silk but you know Sarah was saying that you know it's not their place to kind of like change the history of this quilt and they're not adding they're just keeping what's already there like more intact but then if it's disintegrated anyway wouldn't it be better to kind of keep adding things and then and then making the history of the quilt longer like you said with restoring it by adding your own little stamp on it I think it's more to do with if you keep restoring it and restoring it at some point it's going to be not it's going to have nothing original on it ever so it would keep it going and going but then the people who first make it aren't the people who made that quilt they're just the people who kind of drew out the outline of what they needed the quilt to look like I remember one of the things Sarah said was the the whole thing in Only Fools and Horses of Trigger's broom where he says that he's like, oh, he's had this broom for 20 years or whatever and it's never failed him, but it's had like seven new heads and four new handles. So obviously it's not the same broom. So it's kind of the question of when does an object become something new? That's quite interesting as well, because I know my mother taught me how to sew and her mother taught her how to sew and so on and so on. And this quilt conservation, people are being taught how to sew. It's kind of... It's like not only are they this quilt is going down being conserved throughout the years, sewing as a kind of technique is you, you don't really learn it unless you're shown how to do it. So it's kind of being passed down the years how to sew. After spending days upon days with these ladies and this quilt, like they're so passionate about it, you can't help but have that passion rubbed off on you. You can't help but feel like, like I'm genuinely upset that this quilt is going to go in this storeroom, like because it's beautiful, it's so gorgeous, and I think it's very sad that, you know, the 11th of May is when that the exhibition comes down, and that's when that quilt is going to be folded up and put away in a storeroom, which. It's very bleak, like the storeroom, it's not as bright as the other room. It's, they barely have people going in unless they need something from the storeroom. So this beautiful quilt that was made for people, like by people, is gonna be put away in a storeroom full of other quilts. Also the volume of quilts in the storeroom was quite amazing. I didn't realize how many they had. And it just goes to show the, the quilts that are in the exhibition that is just a very small selection of all those other quilts and it's kind of a shame that there isn't enough space to show them all. Were they to hang all the quilts on the wall then they'd need something the size of the National Library and you know that the stuff is going back into storage so that you know 50 years from now someone can take it out and have you know and be appreciated it. Because if you, well, if all these quilts were still being used as quilts, then they wouldn't be here in 50 years. I think you can either preserve something or you can use it, but I don't think you can do both.